dad, early on, taught me to love the natural world, early and none such part. We watch her leave, and my dad looks around. No park keepers. Now, he says, be quick. He lifts me into the scented whiteness of a may tree in full flower until I can see over the lip of a mud-woven nest. I'm lowered and we back through twigs and bee hum into the open and away. Four blue eggs, I whisper, and a bare squirmy thing. Well done, a hatchling. We wait on a log to be certain the thrush returns and see her flit into the whiteness, worm in beak. Good, she's back, come along. And he takes my hand, me stretching to match his stride, he with spring in his step. He was quite pleased to have <laughs> his little success. I was born into the Second World War, and times are really hard after the war. We have an Englishman here, but he's far too young to remember. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, uh, young people from working class families, they had to leave school and go out to work to help earn money for their families. This poem is called Coal Delivery. Mother feared that the coal man might deliver us one sack short and told me to stand in the unheated front room to count all 10 sacks. The slight man climbed aboard his flatbed lorry, stacked a double row of five bulging burlap bags along the near edge, jumped down and heaved the first onto his back. He staggered, found his balance and lugged it through our side gate. I heard the rumble of tipped coal as he poured it into our empty bin. Soon bored, I lost count and practiced handstands against the bare wall. He tapped at our kitchen door to be paid. I'd neglected my job, but ran to join my mum. She counted out careful pounds, shillings and pence to give him. I saw how stooped he was, yet young, not so much older than me. His clothes, cloth hat, the skin of his face and hands ingrained in coal dust his back bent beneath the weight of limited possibility. Mm -hmm. Hard days. Yeah. I'll flip through here. This is a sort of fun one. Um, I'll have to manage with the microphone. Um, we have great pleasure with our grandchildren. And I took little Satcher to the Wysatta Library, at Wysatta Library. I pull the long velvety sock onto my arm. It has stork eyes, a Sesame Street gait, and a coil of soft fabric at my elbow. Hello, little Satcher, it says. <laughs> Our grandson's eyes grow soft. Am I a rabbit, it asks, eager to know. No, and Satcher shakes his head. Then I must be a mouse. No, 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 he squirms. I hitch up the flop of fabric at my elbow. Perhaps I am a goat? Nope. His eyes shine. The library, bookshelves, other toddlers cease to exist in his engaged presence. I don't know who I am, my arm laments. The sock twists its mouth into glumness, droops his head, eyes sagging, and sobs to itself. Concern clouds such as person. He points to the coil at my elbow. You am a snail, he tells the sock. <laughs> Patting my arm, the puppet lifts its head. A snail? I'm a snail. It nuzzles his neck, asks, are you a snail too? Satcher shakes his head. I am a boy. I like you, the sock <coughs> tells him, and he hugs my arm hard. He's as free from time and being as breeze-blown thistle seed. Yeah, fun. Um, my husband is a, or was, an academic physician. He's alive, but he's retired. <laughs> 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 and um, when he 
he travelled to meetings, I would go with him if I could. And in New Orleans, I saw a statue that just really touched me. New Orleans bronze. Jean-Baptiste Lemoyne de Bienville stands tall, chin tilted, frock coat lifted in a Louisiana breeze, breeches tied above determined calves. He holds the staff and scroll, lands gained with a fresh thumbprint. Behind the honored founder, a priest in sackcloth robe, heavy rosary hanging from his waist, face impassive. His work done. Seated below them both, a Chickasaw chief, features finely cut, deep set eyes downcast, his people's peace pipe empty in his hand. Manifest destiny. Well, one feels that I need to. So I might do this funny little thing. It's shaped like a bonsai. Oh. And this title is Craft, and there's a play of word in craft. Bonsai means a tree in a shallow dish, a tree like any other, with the potential for space, sky, light, and life. This tree has been root pruned, like a foot-bound girl child, limbs trained for elegance of form, undesirable growth plucked away until it is an exquisite miniature of itself, a fine possession, convenient and small, a thing to be prized and kept indoors. Not very nice, is it? <laughs> um, we have a bit of fun, I think, with this letter. Clips at Starbucks. She slight the girl in front of me, the line long, barista slow. He works, impassive as a machine. I cannot see her face. From the back, a loose rope of fair hair coils over her collarbone, disappears inside the bosom of her sweatshirt. The line shuffles forward. Broad barista eyes engage. She orders grande cappuccino, lashes skim mahogany cheeks as he leans towards her makes her repeat her order. His shoulders broaden, chest puffs, narrow hips taut. He returns her change, fingers lingering in contact, leans across the counter to point where her coffee will be, perhaps to catch the scent of her. It's my turn. Small latte, decaffeinated. He takes my money, calls, next. <laughs> <laughs> Coffee in hand, I look to see the face that so awakened him. She's gone. I glimpsed the moon's unlit curve, missed it shining round. Oh. <laughs> My dad did plant a love of nature in me, and we live uh, on a hill with some woodland below, and I rise early, and I just see amazing things sometimes. These woods hold silences. Deep in winter woods, a flick of movement, a fox circling the base of a great maple. It rushes the tree, runs at the truck, trunk and drops back. Again and again, fox sits alert, nose pointed upward, tries once more, gives up and mooches off. Perhaps there's a meal up the tree, trapped between two perils, my tea too hot to sip. All is still until a gray squirrel scoots down the trunk, dashes over open snow, swoop, wide wings, a red-tailed hawk, locks the squirrel in dagger talons. Minutes pass, fur tail twitching. Morning tea grows cold. Hawk grips, cold intimacy of death. The double helix of prey and predator intertwined, each designed for the possibility of the other. Hawk lifts into flight a banner of grey tails streaming behind. Nature red in claw and tooth. Yeah. Um, I wrote about the day that 
pandemic was declared, and then I wrote about again about a month later, in a time of contagion. Long displaced by human growth, kangaroos explore Sydney suburbs, jackals saunter Tehran's broad avenues, and dolphins frolic in Venetian canals. Residents of Beijing, Shanghai, and Delhi marvel at blue skies, unseen for a generation. In polished nights, Venus gleams bright, and airplane-free skies open to the sounds of swans and geese winging north, red wings and robins belling peaceful air, the roar of rushing roadways hushed in a time of hallowed quiet, our damaged planet breathes. We have a problem. Um, I'll read this little poem. It's certainly about a snapping turtle. Perhaps it's about writing a poem. Incubation. Through a sunrise window, I see a snapping turtle digging among my petunias, baggy trousered back legs, churning soft dirt, huge carapace, flattening flowers, her need urgent. The cavity deep enough, she drops in leathery eggs the size of ping pong balls, pedals her nest closed and leaves the sun to do its work, nursing the darkness summer long in dirt's warm room. Then one October day, a thought, an inkling, an opening in the silence, clawing upwards with penny-sized bite, something new and tender climbs into the light. Turtles and that poem. Um, I had a vis we had visiting a dog, and I, it was January, and I got up early and walked the dog in deep snow, uh, and I happened to see a, a lunar eclipse that I didn't know was going to happen. Earth casts its shadow across the moon. Drowsy in dressing gown and boots, I idled along the driveway, Cody's nose <coughs> interpreting the happenings of the night. Lifting my gaze from the dog's cheery tail, I chanced to glance westward, saw through dark branches a great orb, a bruised-looking eye, mottled in shades of purple and ruby, its lens a brilliant disk of light, focused downwards as though studying its parents, seeing how earth burns and suffocates in the smog of our needs. The moon itself, trespassed by our ambitions, our planet home, burdened by our burgeoning demands. The moon's eye blinked shut, I shivered. And then the closing poem, When Our World Was Whole, a friend and I drove out to Wright County to, to watch the cranes roosting there. When our world was whole, we near the refuge as skeins of moonlit mist lift, and we hear the music of a thousand cranes roosting in the shallows of restored wetlands. Behind us, the sun crests the horizon, feathering white the needles of frost on reeds and grasses. No wind, just the constant calling as though from distant beginnings in an Eocene dawn, when creatures lived in common symmetry before our coming. In a clamor of wild voices, cranes rise into morning on slow wings. Can I do one more? Yes. It's quick and short. And I, know, I know what page it is. There we go. Um, I did become the mayor of my city inadvertently. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the poem is called The City Official Open for Poetry Jotter. And I had to be responsible, finally, for the budget. A city official opens her poetry jotter and finds a formula. The budget is what the city needs to spend. The levy is the money needed to support the budget, minus other fees. 
property tax is the assessed value multiplied by the class rate, divided by the total tax capacity. Combine the levy and the property tax, you have the total tax rate. Add a contentious election, chambers packed with restless residents, multiply by regular packets, packed with data, divide by keeping house and husband, and you have a poet's soul slipping into intractable deficit. <laughs> story behind all my words. I'm trying to find a nice picture of me. Yes. Oh, there yes. is so there's a bunch. All the pictures are up here, up here and somebody painted me. Nice. Mm. This is in black and white. Mm. And this one is in color. Mm. Mm, oops. I know this has been an amazing journey for me. My name is Ishwari Raja. And Ishwari literally means goddess in my culture. In Nepal. I'm from Nepal. And my grandfather named me Ishwari. I was the first in the next generation line. So my book actually says, Screams of a Goddess. And as you hear, listen to the poem, I'm guessing it will make sense. It will make sense why it's called Screams of a Goddess. This book is very important to me because a few days ago, I watched, uh, I was invited to watch a, um, a film preview and it was called Madhvi something. It was called, started with M and then a little difficult to go after. But it was very triggering for me because it was about a girl from a caste system back home in India, not in Nepal. And it was, she was from unseeable caste. So she could not be seen. She had to hide herself. The, she means her whole uh, community had to hide uh, from people they could not be seen and if they they were seen by other person you know it was it was not a good sign so it was very triggering for me because um, I was told or as in caste system I'm untouch I'm born untouchable I'm born in the untouchable caste mm. and when you are in untouchable caste the privileges that comes with being just human beings like going to school going to just being able to touch things, being able to just live is not there. And my parents did their best by making sure that we don't go to things that might, um, where we might be discriminated. So going to my friend's houses, going to anybody else's houses, and there is, was not allowed. My mom was very strict because she faced the discrimination that was so in deep ingrained in her. She, was, she told herself that her kids would not face that discrimination. And one thing they made, apart from many good things, one thing they made sure was that we go to school. And so having, how do you know if a person is from a low caste or something is their name? So my name is Ishwari, the surname is Raja. So from, peop from people, people from back home, when, they, when I introduce myself, their question is, uh, what's your full name and where are you from so do you know where you are from there used to be sections where you lived certain caste of people lived so they know where which caste you are and how to behave with you whether to discriminate you or actually uh, what's the word reverge or you know be, be um, revered by you so having this name at the Raja um, in the book is a big deal for me and for my community um, in Nepal. So that's why that's the story about the book. Isn't it interesting? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So my my this I just published this book myself. It's on Amazon, and I also have copy that I sell. But when I want what I want to do is I want to go home back home in Nepal and publish this book and have the name Rajak right there for people to see that somebody from my cast published a book. Yeah. That's the story of the book. Now the poems. I got 
got a whole bunch. There are 72 poems in the book, and I will not bore you with 72. We'll read a few. <laughs> okay. You saw the book. So I am from Nepal, and as you might know, curries, curries chutneys, spices, and light, festival of lights. Bihar is from Nepal and India part of it. So Bihar is called, uh, we call it Bihar and festival of lights. When I came to the, Amer when you, I came to the States, a lot of things happened and that's how the book happens. So this poem is about Bihar. It's called festival of lights. It is, B it is Bihar festival of lights, the lights, songs and many dances. We raised basic necessities when life was hard. With pride, we sang and we danced. Smell of those flowers, scent of the fruit, the lights, food, and all that work. Everyone had a part. Diligently, we worked to celebrate Bihar. Too much work, we complained then. Someone once said, enjoy small things now because they become the big things later. My became memories, just a dream. I miss the food, the family, smell of those flowers, scent of the fruit, the songs we made up and dances with no rhythm, all that hard work we once complained about. I miss them all. <laughs> Other thing is my parents had five daughters and it was 45 years ago they had me. And it was, sons are all more important than women as we, or girls, as we know, we know many things that happen to girls. And so this poem is about how my parent, or my, one particular incident I witnessed uh, my dad from, of my dad, from my dad. Father's Day, it's called. Outside my house, I heard a father, a father tell his daughter, a prince in a shiny armor, riding a white horse, will bring ultimate joy. Everything you do is a prep. Be a good girl, walk soft, talk soft, be nice, be kind, and be quiet. The father was proud, a big smile as he dreamt, a dream of a son-in-law, a prince in a shiny armor, riding a white horse, to bring him ultimate joy. Next door, a father of four, in the attic he saved, big, shiny, ready tied gifts, anxious and happy as he waited, a son-in-law, a prince in a shiny armor, riding a white horse to bring him ultimate joy. Standing outside in a silent dark night, I heard my father tell a daughter, tell a woman about his five. My daughters will whistle and kick ass. I need no son-in-law, no prince in any armor, no one riding a white horse, happy and excited as he waited his fearless feminine, feminist daughters to bring him ultimate joy. <laughs> so we got five daughters, five in a total, or all girls. And it was hard to understand about boys. We had no, had no boys, all me. And my father also died when he, I was very young, when I was only 13 and my sister's younger. I'm the oldest one. So it was hard for me to understand men around me, especially my husband. So then my sister had a son, the first one in the next generation line. And it helped me to understand the men in my life, especially my husband. So this poem is for him. This is called Big Boy. A big boy chimes, a little boy at heart. I have to shower? Really, am I a grown up? A surprised voice, a naughty smile. In the shower he is, guided by a beautiful girl, a little boy at heart. Comes out clean, clean and freshened up, just like a grown up that he is. No boy I understood, or girls that we were. My sister then had a boy, a little boy, cute, smart, and just little. Now I understand just a little bit more of the boy in my life. Mm -hmm. This is a riddle. After I'm done, you can raise your hand and tell me what it's about. <laughs> okay. It's called the hole. Put your hand in the hole. Mystery is its origin. Lucky you are if you get a fruit. 
and if perhaps such is a belief in a temple far or forest in Kathmandu. There was no rain, a grandma raised the whole of a granddaughter. Fear the wrath, she screamed, wrath of an angry hole. The sky is warned, the rain comes soon after. Such is a belief, a trust in a hole somewhere in the world. The creation, the only tool for the continuation of humankind is the whole. The mystery, the wrath, the kindness, and the only tool. Why is it then the whole, as priceless as it is, has no power? Becoming the only cause, only tool to stain, taint the heart and the body, the family and the society. The existence of a whole, the only reason to be abandoned by the family, stoned by the society, and mysteriously killed. Unlucky are the ones bearers of many holes. Guess what the hole is? It's where the people come from. The vagina. <laughs> I'll be banned. Uh -huh. That will help sales. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. So the next one is called anti-feminist. Because I teach to cook, I get. I came to America to complete my master's degree because somebody told me that I can't be a manager without a master's degree. So I was like, okay, I will go get master's degree. So I came here, got two, and I was like, I, I don't want to be manager again. And so. <laughs> And then I started teaching cooking because I saw no Nepali person, or at least that I could see in Minnesota. There were no Nepali a person teaching Nepali food. So I thought <coughs> I'd just make Nepali food. I teach Nepali food to teach Nepali, yeah, Nepali cooking. I'd make chutneys, I make uh, chocolates with spices, and I make uh, spice kits, all of these things. So people ask me, you know, you've got two master's degree, degrees, you came here to be a manager, so what happened? So this is about anti-feminism. Many people ask me why I choose to, why I chose to teach to cook. Going back to the tradition, a traditional role for a woman, is it not anti-feminism? For me, I reply, being able to make a choice, that freedom of choice is feminism. Cooking is not anti-feminism. Being forced to cook with no other options is anti-feminism. That right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we want choices, not labels. Mm -hmm. All right. I know we are from that generation where some of you might know what I'm talking about. It's called sundown. Still in my school uniform, I came home late. That unfortunate night, the sun had gone down, walked a few miles, I missed the bus. So on the way, stopped at an enemy's, I giggled, laughed, and had a lemonade walked home after. My mom was waiting by the gate quietly. I smelled the trouble, felt the swiftness of the belt, land on my body, the cry I could not make, the silent cry, the muffled, the silent tears, the muffled cry, the blood of my wounds, I tested, I tasted them all before I felt them. As I walked slowly into the closed door, holding my breath, I closed my eyes, waiting for the belt to swiftly land on my body. We've all been there, have we not? Okay, a few more, and then next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I felt for a long time in life. I'm in my 40s, and forever, when I was growing up, I was told that I'm not beautiful. I have darker skin. I'm a little bit bigger than I should be according to the society norm, you know. So I was told forever that how, how ugly I was. And this is what happened to me eventually. In the mirror, it's called. I stared at the ugly me in the mirror. In the photo, I stared. So cruel to myself, the rudest. Maybe even kill my being, tear the skin apart to show the world I care about their opinions of me. This is, this might be a little triggering for people. So if it is, you can quietly raise hand and you take a breath. Uh -huh. uh, this 
is called darkest knowing. I'm fucked up, I know, because I was fucked without my know. Was I five, seven, or eight? I don't know. I grew up angry and pissed. My heart drew no reason for the pissiness, angry and pissed without my know. People said, your heart is as black as your face. Many times black, my blackness pointed out. Why, I ask. The reason I don't know. Beautiful heart that I have waiting to be discovered. Why I waited, I don't know. I'm fucked up that I know. 20 years it took to tell my mother I was fucked without my know. Where is my dad? Dead long gone. That I know, dead without knowing his daughter was abused without his know. Did the abuser pay extra? Was I bought extra food and clothes without my know? I don't know. But do I really want to know? It was fucked up that I know. Pimping out my body at tender age without my know. Money was coming in had I known. Would I speak out for everyone to know? I don't know. Years of silence fucked me up. My face turned blue and my heart black without my know. Yeah, I'm guessing we all know what that was about. Mm -hmm. All right, a little bit of laugh, I guess. All right, next one is called Child Within. Happiness we strive, intense feeling, killer of sensations, mountain of glee, roar of laughter, heart-wrenching cry, wrath of anger, intensity of emotions as we, as a child we felt we lose. Happiness we strive as adults, no joy in anything, find the child hidden within us deep. This is the prescription for joy. Okay, one, a few more. This is another triggering one, and this will be it for the joy. Into the night it's called. I was eight, or was I five? One night in the bed, lying on my back, eyes closed, ready to smile, slowly in the dream, I hear a whisper, are you awake? He needed my consent to rape me. Night after night, for many more nights, I heard the whisper, are you awake? Sometimes I lie there, awake and eyes shut, pretending to sleep dead stiff. Now I lie next to the man, the man I love. As his body moves deep in his sleep, I wait for the whisper, are you awake? Mm -hmm. All right, all of those. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Now, all of these, so I went to therapy and so I did a lot of healing for, for a long time. And I, I didn't even like poems, but in 2016, all of a sudden, I just started writing poems. Yeah. And in 2021, I, I also work as a development manager for, uh, for a nonprofit. And I, my, one of my main job is to look for grants for the organization. So while looking for grants, I found out that there are actually grants for writers, authors, and creative people. So I found one for myself, I applied, and I got $4,950, okay. and I published my book. So mm -hmm. I found all the points I had written, not all, but they were all over the place. I found what they collected whatever I could, and then I wrote a few more, maybe I, and I wrote another 40, and then I published the book. I found people, I put it on Amazon, and here we are, right? Yeah. It's the magic of being independent. You can do whatever. <laughs> Good, no, not bad. <laughs> so okay, just a few more and then we'll be done. So this book, as you can see, it's a lot to do with voice. It's a screen, it has voice in there and also in the pictures inside. So the voice is very important to me. And I know the, the things that I share today right now will be on YouTube and then it, I have no idea. There's just too much noise in the world and it might just get lost. But it's very personal to me and sometimes I have a feeling I'm like, am I really doing this right or I should be quiet? But I would say for, I, I kept quiet for more than 35 years and I think it's time that I say things and I might be voice for other people or 
no, but I it would be it would you know it's not everybody that there's the data show that a lot of people are abused and bad things happen. But here I am uh, being a voice. So just a few more about voice. This is called rising the beast. Walking on the beach, many stones I see, all shiny, glistening, different and beautiful, minding their own business. I admire them, smile on my lips. I touch a shiny, perfect stone with my toes playfully. Suddenly found myself pushing it hard, harder and harder into the sand. The monster in me awake, wanting it to suffer, to disappear, bury deep inside to die. Vanish deep under the beauty of something sometimes awakens the beasts in other. Okay, that's, it's, this is called the, my voice. I spoke up once, it wedged a war. Quickly a line of authority came into being. I spoke up again, it broke her mother from her dreams, rattled her to the core, questioning her every step. My voice is a powerhouse. So I keep it locked up, hidden in the back of my throat, chained to my heart, covered by reasoning. It is like a set of precious jewelry making up, making appearance only during special occasions. Thank you so much for this. Distorted, a kaleidoscope of colors forming pictures in my head. These broken glasses have gotten me through life, a little shattered, a little distorted. A kaleidoscope of feelings forming memories in my head. I bridge these memories and pictures, forming a book of shattered reflections. Page by page, I relive, relive these times, these emotions. I smile with satisfaction at the life I've created through a broken view of the world to form a kaleidoscope of colors where only darkness stood. Um, so that kind of explains my book a little bit. So that's the um, poem on the back of the book. Um, my book um, of poetry is called Shattered Reflections. Um, and so I've been writing poetry since I was 15 years old. Um, I came across poetry in an English class and fell in love and found that it was the perfect way for me to express all of this stuff. Um, and so when I sat down at 40 to write this book, I went back through journals and journals and journals and picked select poems from the age of 15 to the age of 40, um, kind of in a memoir, I guess, in poetry form. And I um, use it to talk about all kinds of things, um, rape, um, the loss of a child, um, trying to find your place in the world, not feeling good enough, finding love, having children, um, and finding contentment. So, um, the next poem that I will read, I will start with one from my teen years. I thought these little things would help me find my pages better, but it's not working. <laughs> Tears on shed will never flow, for the pain is too great. The sickness in your head, the sickness in my stomach, no different for they share the same secret of that night when you got your way and I had to fight. The next one I'll read is called Letting Go. I wrote this at age 28, um, and it's about watching your children grow. Loosen your grip, take a breath, and release. Through cloudy eyes, I watch you step away and walk on your own. Wobbly you go, strongly you carry on your own, looking back with a smile. I loosen my grip, take a breath, and wave. Through cloudy eyes, I watch you step away and walk on your own. 
Swiftly you run faster and faster. With, you float away with a quick wave and a smile. I loosen my grip. I take a breath and I smile. Through cloudy eyes, I watch you step away and walk. somebody had said that you should pick make a list of all of the words that you hate mm -hmm. and then pick one and write about it mm -hmm. um, and so I picked a word that I hate and it ended up kind of being um, a poem about just having one of those days with the person you love so it's called lazy trailing my lazy finger down my throat caught in the summer breeze I watched the birds dive and sing my head resting upon your chest, made lazy by the heat, the heat of the sun, of you. I understand why people feel the need to lay around, eyes half closed with nothing but time. Your hand lazily, lazily strokes my hair, and I am happy, at ease. No need to work, no need to move, your hand resting on my knee. I understand the need to be lazy, lazy in the way I take you in one eyeful at a time, lazy in the way that you whisper you are mine. Lazy in the way we embrace with nothing but time. In the full sun of the day, I sit still, embracing the quiet, the hearts beating together and away. I understand lazy and surrender to stay this way. This one is another one from um, age 39. This one um, kind of puts into play um, my love for yoga and how it's helped me heal on my journey through everything. So, laughter and tears mingle with fears, cobwebbed between here and there, circling the heart in my triangular fashion. I am child, pushed back on knees, arms outstretched, holding the Mother Earth to me, warm in her embrace, gripping the grass with my fingers, wild as the moon, angry in my need for grounding. My feathers rough and unused, inhaling the sweet aroma of my inner light, turned yellow from gratitude. The toad holds the magic. My inner witch rose quartz in hand. I am love, love for you, love for me, love for the giggling blues of the galaxy, suspended in the field of my hidden desires. My fears wash away with my tears, and I laugh as I brush the cobwebs from my green goddess wrapped in the grass of Mother Earth. I shake my wings and I take flight. Um, let's see. I'll go to um, one I wrote at age 20 um, entitled Butterfly. And this is just kind of about um, not feeling good enough and like your own skin and who you are. So. Lost in a maze, locked in a world, struggling with confusion. I see a face, ever changing. I am afraid, alone, amazed, love. I wonder about butterflies and cobwebs. Can I move? No, but I can sing. Soft and sweet, I hear, I can hear it. Can you? Is it pretty, ugly, sane, mad? I am sur surrounded by it, covered in tears. I smile, what else is there to do? are empty, all my love to give, my heart is shattered, never to be fixed. You are floating away on the whispering wind. So close I can touch that pale, beautiful face. You are so far, you do not hear, see, feel, my empty pleas echoing off the walls. My dry tears fall on the roses scent. My precious love, not aware I cry. Never able to cradle you in my arms, never to hear your cries. The flowers dry up and wither away, but still my tears fall. Always in my mind, my heart, left to die, arms empty. They say I will get over it in time, but I still rock you to sleep and sing you lullabies. 
The roses still sit on the windowsill. You fell for me like the petals, floating away on a whispering wind, arms empty with dry tears. Let's see if I can find one. Not so sad. <laughs> um, this is called Crowd Watching. Um, it was age 34, and this is just me sitting in the mall waiting for my kids. <laughs> I sit from my perch watching the crowd swim. A fat man shuffles by and smiles warmly. I cannot help but think about his fat, but mine is just the same, wobbling back and forth as I shuffle. A high-class woman clicks by with her nose in the air, and I cannot help but think of her, of her clothes and her hair, but mine are just the same, nose up with hair and the clothes to someone else. The swimming can continues in a light whisper of, I want, I wish, I need, why not me? All swimming in a sea of sweat and tears, thinking of self-doubt and jealousy, everyone waiting for the goldfish to take notice and lead us away, to swim in a sea of laughter and smiles, smelling of hope. I sit from my perch and wait for a glimpse of gold and smile at someone else's good fortune. Laying naked, trapped in a silent scream, shattering my heart, moving slowly, I stumble, crawling at my flesh. Please stop the silence, the blackness. Let me see through these blood-stained eyes the happiness that surrounds my beaten body. Can you see me? Can you hear me? I am falling deeper and deeper <coughs> into your web of lies. What is the truth? Can you find it behind that smile slapped across your face? Or is that my blank smile reflected in your eyes? Can I fall? any deeper into this hole. Hold me before I break. My wings cannot fly. You touched me and I am broken. Cover me in the blackness of your silence, piercing my ears. And then I will end um, with the last poem in the book. And it's um, one from age 40. Um, and it's called Window View. Ancient glass framed by white painted wood. The sun sets forming a cotton candy sky atop the trees, the last of the sun's light dancing through the stained glass lilies that crown my window. I sit back, head against the wall, curled up with a blanket, thankful for my window seat in the sky. My apple tree in the, is in blue, soft and delicate, blossoms decorating the branches, branches home to a cardinal, as in love with the pink blush of the falling light as I am, singing her song. I am safe, watching my little red friend, a stark contrast to her calm backdrop. I feel the breeze tangling with my inhales and exhales. My children laugh in the background and I smile, placing a cup of tea to my lips. Are there any questions? If not, it's cheese and cider.
especially when we, we don't live in our community anymore, we, we moved away. So after my dad died, we were five young kids with a young mom. My mom was only 29 when my dad died. So in a way that people did not want to take responsibility of a young woman with five kids. So that slowly pushed us away from being in the community. We're not invited to be, because there was no man, a man to represent us in the community. We were not invited to stop anymore. So just slowly it's, it happened that we moved away from, from, that, from the community and slowly we sold our house and moved away from, from the area itself. So being away from uh, from the from the people and from the from the locality itself is little different. And also he she is half Russian, so that helps too. Mm -hmm. So not being all Nepali. Yeah. And life has changed a lot for women. Uh, I would not I have to like but it depends where you are on what country yeah. it is. If when it comes to getting married or when it comes to going to see somebody's work it Spaces, it, it does matter. And in the caste system? In the caste system, yes. In the city? Yes, it does. In the same, yes. really same area? Uh, not in the in the city, in Kathmandu at least. Uh, it, the, when more people work and are outside, so it's become a lot more, more, more about money than about anything else. Mm -hmm. So that has, in a way, helped. Did notice she became a manager. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. It became. I became the director actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> children and this sort of thing so that's very autobiographical and then I'm very interested in patriarchy mm -hmm. which is like a service mm -hmm. kind of poem. <laughs> uh, and it's um, it, it is a fact in all our lives that we as women um, so I toy with that some of it's playful some of it's more serious mm -hmm. and then the last final section of my poems about the natural world which is really where my heart is. But yeah, it's hard to organize a whole lot of different disparate poems into some sort of sacred sense. So, yeah. Uh, Liz, I'm kind of interested in, uh, you had the poem that you did on the puppet. I really loved it. And when growing, growing up, I mean, it came so natural to you. And I was an elementary counselor and I was like, you know, we had puppets, but I, it was never that imagination that that you had. When you were growing up, did your family play with you with a puppet, or is that something you kind of did? And or is that an isolated incident that you're writing about? We, we had puppets as children, wooden puppets, mm -hmm. and they walk and this sort of thing. But I, my mom read to us a lot. Okay. Wonderful program on the radio called Lip 
from his mother and there'd be different voices and people saying different things and that was very young and family time. Um, and that's a very special picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's this really unique um, of, um, media. You reach people. And, and it's so fascinating to watch him little Thatcher become totally lost. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was when the puppets, uh, when the libraries had puppets, yeah. and now of course they've all gone, but they were wonderful puppets. Yeah. It's now infection, and uh, a lot of the fun has gone from that. Yeah. You, you can still find them. Elm Creek uh, Nature Center has puppets, mm -hmm. little animal puppets. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I have great grandchildren. Yeah, don't tell them that <laughs> about infection. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.